Okay. I always think female clothes aren't designed for these things. Very unfair. Sorry about that. I just had a mind you hold it, didn't it? It's probably. Thanks, Richard. Okay, so uh, I was really hoping that Simeon would do exactly what he has done, which was explain all about the name authority problem so that I wouldn't have to cover all that ground again. So I'm not going to talk about the name authority problem because by now you're all experts on, on that. So what I would like to do instead is talk about some of the work that's been funded as part of the NAMES project in the last few years, um, last year particularly, and how what we're doing fits into the researcher identification landscape, which obviously ORCID is a big part of now. So here's a slide with a, a um, very, gen very gross generalization about the different approaches to author identifier identification that have been um, happening in the past. So on the left, we've got the, um, the library approach to um, authority services, looking at information at the level of the book, doing the work um, up front on disambiguation, not involving authors themselves in the process at all. And on the other side, we've got the publisher approach. We're looking at things like the Scopus and researcher ID services, the, the Scopus author identifier service, and so on. This is the way that, that publishers have done things in the past. They're looking at article level data more often. They're um, generating things automatically and then relying on the authors to come along and, and sort problems out and say, oh, no, that wasn't me, that was me. So there's these, been these two general um, approaches in the past to um, trying to identify authors. And the current international activity, um, we've heard a lot about ORCID just now, but there's also the ISNI approach, which is more of a library-based, um, uh, library-instigated, library-based approach to identifying um, authors and other entities. So the ISNI approach is very broad. Um, authors, again, still generally aren't involved in the process, and disambiguation happens up front, whereas with, or with ORCID, I think the disambiguation is going to happen a bit later on. I think that's the, the approach that, that seems to be, um, as far as I can tell, it, it seems to be the, um, the way that they're going to be doing things. So, so they may, although that's not quite what Simeon was saying just now, so maybe I've got the wrong end of the stick there. Um, but authors definitely, are, um, researchers and contributors are, are very much involved in that process with, with the ORCID approach. And there's a difference in scope there but with ISNI identifying things like, um, you know, fictional characters, ships, all sorts of different um, entities that, that ORCID isn't interested in at the moment. So these are the two big international um, uh, initiatives that are going on right now. And there, there are signs of conver convergence. We had a, a big meeting in London in March. Um, the Knowledge Exchange Group organised on digital author identifiers. And th they, they were very much encouraging the alignment of the ISNI and ORCID approaches. And ISNI indeed has reserved a block of, of identifiers for, for use by ORCID, I understand. So, so there are, there, these groups are talking to each other. And both are interested in using existing sets of information to um, populate their system. So this is just taken from the two websites. Um, ISNI wanting to leverage high confidence data and ORCID linking to other name identifier systems. So, so both of these systems are going to be looking for, for other sets of information to help populate them. And what, what, what might these other systems be? There are a number of national identifier systems out there, and in, at the end of last year, um, our project looked, um, did a survey and a report on some of the existing approaches to name identification at the national level to see what, what was out there, what, um, what we might learn from those other systems. So here's a brief sort of summary, I don't know how easy that is to read. Of the different systems that we looked at, we, we sent out um, a survey to a lot of um, different national organisations. We didn't get replies from everybody, um, and I think we missed a few, um, but these were the ones we, we, we got. And so just to give you an idea of the, um, the time scale, really, that, that these in initiatives have been um, happening over. So the, the oldest one we looked at was the LATE system from Brazil, 
which has been in existence since 1999. So this is a very mature system, and you can tell, you know, looking at the number of identities covered by that system, you know, 1.6 million, uh, it's, it's huge. Um, but then as you come closer, it, they vary a lot, but as you come closer um, to the present day, generally there are fewer um, identities in the systems. Um, but they, they, they vary a lot in the way that they've been developed, the, the motivations for developing them, and the approaches that, that have been taken. So here's an example of another table from the report which just talks about um, how those identifier systems are populated. And you can see that most of them have a hybrid approach. So some are using records imported from other systems, some are created by manually by catalogers, and some allow for generation of, of records by the data subjects themselves. So it, it varies. And some, some of these systems have really good sources of data that they can use to, um, to start with. So the Japanese system, for example, that you, you already had these, um, a, a, an identifier for researchers from another system which they could just bring in and, and use as the basis. And, this, and in the Netherlands, they had the um, National Thesaurus of Author Names, and in, in Norway, they were using um, university human resources data to, to populate these systems. Uh, in the UK, we didn't have anything beautiful like that, so we're very jealous of these countries with their nice sets of data to start with. So the mature national, the more mature systems, these seem to be some of the characteristics of those systems. So usually there's a national organisation that has oversight of the um, identifier system. And it's usually quite well integrated with other systems. So you have um, funding agencies, reporting bodies, government bodies, and institutional repositories, repositories all linked in to this national system. And the in individual institutions usually have a, a, a defined role relating to their own um, staff as, as part of that system. But it's not like that in the UK. <laughs> um, so this is just a little bit of background about what we've been doing here. So the problem was identified and um, put into a, a call issued by JISC in 2006 for the repositories and preservation program. So we, we were always in this repository space from the beginning. Um, and the proposal from MIMAS and the British Library was um, successful. So, so what we proposed was a two-year project to just look at the problem and see what the requirements were in the UK and build a pilot system. So that's where we started out. So a two-year project in 2007. Uh, as you can tell, it's gone on a bit longer than that. So we've had a few um, extensions. When um, one of my colleagues found out that I was going to be involved with this project to do with names, he, he gave me this book, which has a, a short story in it called From the Annals of the Onomastic Society. So the Onomastic Society in this story is um, a group of people who are interested in names. And there's one member who keeps turning up to the meetings and collecting the names that they're talking about obsessively, and they, they think he's a bit strange. But he turns out to be from the future, um, where everybody is called Chang. And so he's coming back to find out about all the names that, that used to be in existence. So I think my friend wanted me to call um, the project the Chang Project, <laughs> but, but we didn't in the end. And uh, names sometimes gets written in capital letters, but it isn't actually a, an acronym. Although occasionally when I'm very bored, I try and make it one. <laughs> um, but the thing is about names, it's, it's quite, can be quite a dry subject, but nearly everybody has a, a name-related story, uh, especially if, you're like me, you have a very common name, or, or, it, or even if you have a very unusual name. You know, ev nearly everybody you talk to, when you start talking about names, they, they, they come out with these stories. In my family, um, we went in for rhyming couples. So on the left there are Horace and Doris, <laughs> and on the right, that's my mum and dad, Bill and Jill. <laughs> who don't share my surname, you'll be glad to hear. Um, so, <laughs> I, I digress. So back to, the, um, back to the names project. The original plan was to use the British Library's ZTOX service, which is um, table of ele electronic table of contents service, which contains information about journal articles dating back to 1993. So we thought this would be a wonderful set of data to work with because it's you know, people writing research articles. 
um, has last names, initials, titles, subject classifications, and so on. But in the end, it, it turned out to be just too big to use um, for the names project because, and, and it's international in scope, so it's got you know every researcher in the whole world who's written an article that's ended up in the British Library. Um, there was no information on affiliations, and because it's only got initials, that makes it very difficult to find definite matches. And it's so big that it was causing us processing issues. So um, we scrapped that plan and came up with a revised plan. Luckily, while we were in, in the process of the project, the uh, merit project was cleaning up the research assessment exercise data from 2008. And they did a very good job. So this was a very nice clean set of data that we could use to create researcher profiles for UK researchers. And we knew they were, you know, they were all affiliated with UK institutions, so it was, it was a good set of data for us to use. Um, and generally, it worked very well, uh, except for the one um, problem case, which was these two chaps, twin brothers <laughs> with the same initials, both writing about paleontology, and they co-author papers. So uh, <laughs> I don't know what their parents were thinking about. Um, <laughs> I mean, I can't tell them apart looking at them there, so I, uh, well, they can. But the, um, yes, yeah, so the civita problem apparently is a well-known problem in these name authority circles. Uh, in, and uh, so we had to face the civita problem. And in the end, we, um, we, we had to make changes to what we were doing in order to solve the civita problem. So, so now in the names database, we do have two DJ civitas, um, but we had to stick their full first names in to get the, to get the, the system to, to accept that they were, in fact, two different people. Um, but yes, as you can see there, the, the names of the papers uh, are very similar. So that's how the dinosaurs broke our system. <laughs> OK, so the merit data, we think, covers about 20% of the active UK researchers, and it might be, that might, number might be a bit higher, might be lower than that. Um, so we have, we have a corpus of 47,000 records now for, for researchers based in the UK. And what we're trying to do now is build upon that and enhance the records. So the ones that have only got initials, we want to put full first names in if we can. Um, and uh, um, obviously increase the number of records in there because 47,000 isn't, isn't a complete set. And there's different ways we're doing that. We're contacting institutional repositories, getting them to help us um, add new data. So we've had information, for example, from um, the universities of Huddersfield. We're, we're currently working on the University of the West of England to get, get information about their um, researchers in. And it, it varies. The quality of the data varies quite a lot. So it's, there's more or less work depending on, on the, what the data from the repositories is like. Um, with the current version of ePrints, it's quite easy for us to just grab the RDF that's um, made available automatically as part of the ePrints um, software. So we've, we, we did that with the Huddersfield data and it worked very well. We're also um, making it possible for researchers to put their information in directly. And this is the submission form that's part of the NAMES website now. So if you go to the submit link at the top of the, of the NAMES homepage, um, this is what comes up, and it's a form where people can give us information about themselves if they're not already in the name system. Um, this is an example of how, why this is important. I, I follow this blog separated by a common language because I live in uh, North America now, and, and I, th I think it's interesting the differences between the language over there and, and the language here. And Lynn Murphy works at the University of Sussex, and she was worried in this blog post um, that you know I was reading from my own interest, and suddenly the, the name authority problem jumps out at me, and uh, I'm back at work again. So she was, you know, stressing about the fact that her name is is appears in lots of different forms, and she was worried about the REF um, process and, uh, and thinking it was going to cause problems for her. So this is an example of, you know, where this having um, an identifier instead of relying on people's names is, is, is important. And how strongly people feel about it and how important it is to get it right. So automation can only achieve so much. We, we, we can get a certain amount right using the automatic disambiguation algorithms that, that Dan here has developed as part of the NAMES project. 
um, but we do have to check them. So you get the civita problem and you get other people like um, there was a researcher who had two institutional affiliations um, like the civitas did, but in that case, we actually wanted it to be the same person. So, so you can't always, you know, what solves the civita problem creates a new problem for that particular researcher. So you have to have a degree of human intervention to be able to check for these things. So we have colleagues at the British Library who are doing manual checks. Every time we get a new data set in, they intervene for us. In fact, the same people who are doing quality assurance for the ISNI um, international service. So they've got experience and um, expertise in this area. So they do a manual check and then we can either tweak the algorithm so that um, th that problem is solved or we can uh, you know, go in and manually change these records if, if that's not going to be a, um, a possibility. At the moment, people can't go in and edit their own data. They can contribute their initial record, but they, they can't then edit it. So you have to get it right if, you, if you're doing that um, at the moment. But obviously, the, the longer term plan would be to be, al allow researchers and contributors to edit their own information. So the ultimate aim for names is to have a high quality set of unique, persistent identifiers for UK researchers and for the institutions that they work in. And obviously we want to make that available to other systems. Um, so for example, last year we exported a bunch of records to the ISNI service and they, they were given ISNI identifiers and form part of that ISNI data set. Um, the business model is a problem for all of these sorts of services. Um, one thing we did in 2010 was to ask um, institutional repository managers whether they'd be willing to pay for additional <coughs> services on top of the basic access to information from, from names. And we were quite encouraged, I think about a quarter of people said that they would be willing to pay um, for additional services, name related services, ex for example, getting a set of identifiers back from a, a, a set of names and um, article information, for example, that, that they had. Because um, we find that institutions are very good usually at um, identifying their own researchers, but then you have all this extra information about external researchers and you don't know who they are. So the, the good thing about having a national or, or an international service is that you can then you know, try and find out who those other, um, who those other contributors and researchers are. So there's an API to the names data. Excuse me, quick drink. Which has quite a lot of flexibility in it, so you can search across the data that's in the service now. And one of the things we used that to build was a plugin for the ePrints repository software, which was released um, last year. So this allows, when people are depositing um, information in the repository, they can start to type a name and then a list of candidate um, <coughs> contributors turns up and they can choose um, the one they want to, to, to populate the um, author field in ePrints. And they can also contribute a new record if, if none exists. So here's um, just a screenshot of that um, ePrints plugin in the, or in the ePrints um, environment. So what happens as you start typing you know, you know what this this does. Just a straightforward um, list drop-down list appears, and then as you hover over the um, the name that that you want, you get the extra little bit of information on on the left of the screen there. So with the affiliation data, the field of interest, and um, a few of the publications that that person's been involved with. So this is all coming from the names um, service. <coughs> Okay, so, so what's happening with names now? Um, we're currently funded till, well, hopefully, fingers crossed if our um, letter gets um, arrived soon, <laughs> we should be funded to the end of December this year. Now, um, Simeon mentioned the researcher ID task and finish group. So this was a GIST conve convened group looking at um, what we should be doing in the UK about researcher identification. And um, that report that they did is, is, was out for consultation in um, June, 
and I think the, re the final report of the consultants went to GISC um, earlier this week. And then th there is a final meeting of that group um, probably in September. So that's going to sort of set the stage as far as GISC is concerned about what, what happens next in the UK. And the th one of the things we've been tasked to do between now and December is to produce an options appraisal report for, for the UK national um, sort of scene. And also in that time, we're going to carry on improving the data that's in names and adding new records. So one of the things we're looking at, at um, processing is the Institutional Repository Search Service, which is harvesting information from lots of different repositories in, in the UK. So it saves going to each indiv individual repository. Hopefully we'll just look at that data and, and, and see what we can get out of, out of that in terms of identifying um, UK researchers. So that's that's quite exciting if we if we can get hold of that. I mean, it's at Mimas, so hopefully it shouldn't be too hard to uh, to get hold of. So um, just to sum up, where where name sits in this in this um, landscape at the moment, it's a kind of a hybrid, I think, of those two p r approaches that I've described earlier, because. We're doing a lot of automated matching and disambiguation, but we've also got the human quality control um, library aspect of, um, of, of the two approaches. The data that's in names is immediately available for reuse in, in other systems. So as soon as it's updated, that, that's um, available. And researchers can supply information to us, although at the moment they can't edit the records, but that's, that, will, that will come if, um, if names continues to um, grow. The whole thing's a very evolving area. I mean, when we started in 2007, ORCID was till, still two years away. Um, ISNI was being talked about. I don't think it was called ISNI even at that point. So, so everything's changing very quickly, and it's, um, it's hard to know. You know, you put your marker in the sand, and then the tide washes it away the next day. It, it's, things change a lot. And I think some of the p challenges we're facing aren't so much the technical ones as the cultural and political ones. You know, ORCID comes along and suddenly, well, where does that leave a national service? Um, I think that, that there is a role for national services, um, but it's, it, it's where you set the boundaries and how you sell that and how you get funding for it when there's you know, big things like ORCID coming along that obviously um, <coughs> people have heard of because it's got, they've got um, a huge amount of um, awareness. So getting agreement and coordination, I think, at the national level is going to be vital if, if, if it's decided that a national service is what, what we need in the UK. I and mean, if it's not, it's not. That, that, that's that. But I think that there are things that a national service can do in terms of being embedded in other national services that w would be harder for, a, for an international project to do. Okay, I think that's it. So that's where we are. And um, thanks. Thank you very much, Amanda. Um, obviously, again, well in time. So uh, some questions, please. I see one straight away over there. Come to you. Sir. I should have put uh, Simeon on the spot with this one, actually, but you may have better appreciation having looked at the national systems. Um, how are recently deceased authors being handled? So you mentioned, for example, that you, some of your data sources have all the authors since 1993 that you looked at. Um, you started in 2007 versus when ORCID starting. Are you just taking what's there when you start, or are you doing any active work to go back and pick up deceased authors? Uh, no, I don't think we would ever go and try and find out who's dead. <laughs> no. <laughs> a lot of retrospective, um, there's a lot of retrospective material in repositories now. Mm. The digitized journals that go back a ways. These people won't be in the identification system, so you won't be able to tie these items in repositories to IDs, which can still be an issue for disambiguation and so on. Yes, I agree. And um, I mean, disambiguation of, of people who aren't alive is just as important, although probably not what the publishers so much are interested in, but, but yes, it is important for, um, we've been talking to colleagues who work for the Archives Hub and they're interested in disambiguating 
you know, long, long dead people. Um, so so it's, it, it's all part of the same problem. Um, just depends where you're putting your focus at the moment. We're putting our focus on the, the currently active researchers, but uh, it's not to say that in the future we wouldn't be interested in also looking at the uh, sort of the historical aspect too. Okay, thank you very much. Right. Oh, one down the front. Oh, Simeon. <laughs> I just wanted to comment that Orchid has basically adopted the, the same approach. Uh, in particular, if you get into you know, ownership issues of who owns a record and things, it, it's, a, it's a different realm. Where was I going? Here. I'm uh, Lisa Cruzy from University of Queensland in Australia. And we have um, 1,400 authors who have registered with the researcher ID. But I just have a question on um, how you would marry, you know, your national system with the ORCID system. How would you associate the mm. authors? Well, we've, we've got space to have other identifiers within our system. So we can, have as, we can associate as many identifiers as, as there are with any one in individual. So how we technically interoperate with ORCID, we, we don't know yet. Um, it's not something we've, we've gone into a lot, um, but that would be the, obviously, you know, the aim to, to do that and to hold all kids within a, our system as well as the names identifier and any others that we have. Yeah. 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 Um, definitely squeeze one more in. Uh, how do you integrate your system with the system which are supported by Web of Science and other, I mean, commercial uh, databases or publications? Oh. We, we haven't yet, um, <laughs> but as I say, we, we can hold other identifiers, so we could hold a, a researcher's identifiers mm. in other systems as well, but we're, the system is not integrated with others because it's still a prototype, a pilot system. Is it a quick one? Uh, could you elaborate a bit on, on the services that you uh, mentioned you see a national national identifier could uh, provide over what uh, a global one could? Um, when you look at the, at the services that we looked at around the world, that it, it varies from country to country how, the, how those services are integrated with other services. Um, I think it, it will depend on each country's requirements. The funding bodies, for example. Um, my, my, my feeling is that a, a national service can be more responsive to the needs of the immediate community more than an international service might be. So you can tailor your service to, to meet those requirements. So in the UK, we've got the um, Higher Education Statistics Agency who are interested in, in identifying people who work in universities. So they might have a requirement for, for a national name authority um, service, which ORCID might not be in a position to to help them with. I, I, it's just an example. But, th but there's, there's different ways, I think, that a national service might be more um, flexible, perhaps, more responsive than, than perhaps a huge, you know, service like ORCID, which is going to have so many different um, stakeholders that, that it's not going to perhaps be able to respond to every single stakeholder's particular requirements. Okay, I think we'll uh, call an end to that one. Thank you very much, Amanda. And last, but by no means least, we have Ryan. <coughs>